Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone tuning in. It's a huge honor to be speaking here today, and I'm very excited for my first ever KofferCon. Okay, so to give you a bit of background about myself, my name is Agniva, I'm a software engineer at Mattermost, and today I'm going to talk about a very niche area of performance optimization, which is called bounds check elimination. We'll start off with understanding what a bounce check is, and then take a peek under the hood of a bounce check. Then we'll take a look at some of the common patterns found throughout the standard library to avoid these checks. Then I'll be showing a demo where we'll apply some of the things that we learned in the earlier section in a real world example and reap some performance improvements. And in the last section, I'm going to talk about some of the things to keep in mind while using these patterns. So, what are bounce checks? Let's take an example. Assume that we are setting the value of a slice at a particular index. Now, intuitively, you would assume the compiler to do something like this. We get the base address of the underlying array at the offset i, and then set the value of the address to n. But, it does something like this. It adds an if condition to check if i is within the length of a or not. And this if condition is what we call a bounce check. So essentially, that means that for every single slice access, we have to pay the price of an if condition. Now, this can be quite painful. Why should I pay for unnecessary bounce checks when I can write proper code and avoid all of that? For example, if there's a loop from 0 to len of a minus 1 and I'm accessing a of i inside the loop, there's no need for a check. Even if we were looping from 0 to n and if we knew that n is less than length of a, even then there's no need for a check. So, do we really need a bounce check? Can a program function without it? Yes, C++ doesn't have bounce checks and they are fast. But the problem is that they trust the programmers to do the right thing. But we are only humans. We make mistakes. And the cost of those mistakes are very, very high. Even if there is a single unhandled bounce check error, it can be a disaster. Things like buffer overflows and segmentation faults can and will happen and your program can not just crash, but hackers could take advantage of those things and bad things could happen. So what do we do? If we don't have them, our programs can crash disastrously. But if we do have them, then we lose out on performance. Do we just sacrifice performance for safety? Is it possible to have our cake and eat it too? Well, of course. That's what this talk is about. The trick is to let the compiler do the heavy lifting. Remember the example I talked about earlier where we go from zero to less than line of a? Well, I kind of lied because the compiler actually analyzes the code and it knows that since the loop goes from zero to line of a minus one, at no point in the loop can i be something out of bounds of a. So there's actually no bounds check in this case. But what about something like this? Here we are iterating from 0 to 4 and the compiler doesn't know if 4 is within the bounds of A or not. So since it doesn't know, it has to introduce a bounce check. But what if we do? If we as a programmer know that the length of A is always going to be less than or equal to 5, then we can provide some hints to the compiler which it can then use to remove bounce checks. This is basically what the talk is about and what we are going to look in the next few slides. We'll take a look at the few approaches found throughout the standard library on how we can provide these hints to the compiler to remove bounce checks. But before we go into that, we need to be able to see where the bounce checks are being inserted by the compiler. This is the magical compiler incantation that we can use to verify where the bounce checks are being inserted. I am not going to go into details to explain the structure of this command. For now, let's just assume this like that. Essentially, when we run this, it will show a list of output like found is in bounds or found is slice in bounds. 
essentially indicating the lines where the bounce checks are being inserted. But first, let's take a quick look under the hood of a bounce check to see what is really happening there. Here's some sample code. We have a function where we pass the slice and an index and then set the value of the index to 9. Now, here the compiler doesn't know if n is within the length of p or not, so it has to introduce a bounce check. Let's look into the actual assembly generated for a bounce check to understand what really is going on. Alright, so this is what the compiler spits out for those three lines. Now, I don't claim to understand all of this and I won't even attempt to explain everything here. Just a little bit to explain how the compiler actually implements a bounce check. I have color coded the assembly line so that it's easy to keep track of things. The red and blue lines are the first and last lines. The green lines are where the action happens. Now, a bit of go refresher. Remember that when we pass a slice as a parameter, we're actually passing a struct called the slice header, which has three things. The base address of the underlying array, the length of the slice, and the capacity of the slice. So therefore, our parameter stack will actually have four items. The three items from the slice header and n. All right, so let's start. Here we do ax equal to n. Then remember that b actually has three things. So b plus 24 is at the length of the slice. So here we do cx equal to ln of p. Then we do a comparison of whether unsigned of n minus unsigned of ln of p is greater than or equal to zero or not. And if so, we jump to the address 45, which comes here and calls a panic. If that doesn't happen, then it moves on. b plus 16 is the base address of the array. So it does cx equal to b, and then it adds an offset n to the address, dereferences the pointer, and sets the value to 9. Now, the crux of the matter is the if condition. If the compiler is somehow able to derive that the value of the index is within the range of the slice, then it can remove the bounce set. This is the whole game here. And if we can in some way help the compiler to make this deduction, we can successfully remove a check. Now we'll take a look at some of the patterns commonly applied through the standard library to remove these checks. This is our most common pattern where we are iterating from 0 to n minus 1. The compiler doesn't know if n minus 1 is within the bounds of uh, length of p or not, so it inserts a check. Now keep in mind that the bounce check is happening inside the loop, so for n times we have to pay the price of an if condition. To remove that, what we do is we move the check outside the loop. We do what we call a dummy access. So when the compiler sees b of n minus 1, it doesn't know anything and it inserts a check. But when it comes inside the loop, it can see that i is ranging from 0 to n minus 1, so it goes aha. Since p of n minus 1 is already accessed outside the loop, and I'm just going from 0 to n minus 1, so I actually don't need a bounce check here, because essentially that's redundant. If n is outside the range, then it will already crash on the earlier line. So adding another bounce check is of no use and might as well remove it. And this is the core idea behind removing a bounce check. We'll either have a series of checks or checks inside a loop, and our objective would be to move those checks outside the loop. Here is the next most common pattern. We are doing some slice operations at index 0, 1, 2, 3, and as a result, there are bounce checks on every one of them. So similar to last time, we do a dummy axis of B3 at the top, this moves the bounce check to that line, and since every slice axis after that line is less than or equal to 3, so the compiler knows that there is no need for any bounce checks and removes them. Here is a slightly modified version from the last pattern. It's all taken from real world code though. None of these examples are made up. So the difference here is that all of the slice axes are offset from a variable. Alright. So let's try what we know. Uh, let's place a 
b of n plus 5 at the top and see what happens. And doesn't work. We still see bound 6. Why? Because n is still a variable. So if we go back to the earlier slide here, so we just see b of 0, 1, 2, 3. Everything is a constant number. So the compiler is absolutely certain that it can remove the bound 6. But here, we still have an end in between. So the compiler still doesn't know if it's safe enough to remove the check. So what do we do? We do a reslice operation. Remember that reslicing will still point to the same underlying array, so everything remains the same. But there's one thing which has changed. Now there's no more n in the index axis, and the compiler knows that the length of the slice is 6. So b of 0 to 5 is completely safe and therefore it removes the checks. Here's another one where we iterate multiple slices with a known upper bound. We are iterating the slice of A, so there's no bound stick on A, but there are bound sticks on B and C. And similar to before, we move the checks outside the loop by accessing the upper bound of A for both B and C. And our last pattern is where the slice range can be derived. If you see the slice type, you'll notice that it's a slice of bytes, which means that the value of t can only remain within the range of 0 to 255. So we can use that information to remove the check. We can again do a reslice operation to get a subslice of length to 56 and use that. Now the compiler knows the length of the slice and it also knows that t is a byte and therefore will always remain within the bounds of h and therefore it can remove the check. Alright, so now we'll move on to a demo where we'll use some of the patterns that we learned just now and see how much of an improvement that we can get. Okay, so I have a library here which calculates the Levenstein distance between two strings. Now it's not very important to understand what a Levenstein distance is or how even the algorithm works. Let's just apply some of the things that we learned in the earlier section and see how many bound sticks do we have and how many we can get rid of. Okay, so first things first, we'll calculate how many bound sticks there are. Let's run the command. Quite a few. Uh, so we have around seven of them. Okay. So let's focus on the first one. Let's see line 47. And if we go to line 47, okay. So the bound check is for the slice of x. If we see the upper limit of this loop here, we can see that it goes till line s1. And the length of the slice is also line s1 plus 1. So the compiler is unable to make this deduction that ln s1 plus 1 is the same as the upper limit of the loop. So which means that the slice of x should not have any bounds check, but it's unable to make this conclusion. So we can help it. What we can do is we can change this to be ln of x. Now it's exactly the same, the logic hasn't changed, but now the compiler can see that, ah, okay, it goes till length of x and I'm only accessing x of i inside the loop, so I can remove the bounds. Now let's run the command again. Wonderful. So line 47 is gone. One down, six more to go. Okay, let's see the next ones. We have Check set line 58, 60, so 58 is here, xj minus 1, then xj minus 1, xj, and 62 is also xj minus 1. So essentially all of the checks are coming inside this, from this loop. So if we see the upper bound of this loop, again, it's the same, less than equals to ln s1. And again, the checks are on the slice of x. So since j is going from 1 to ln s1, again, the compiler is unable to make this connection. And as a result, it inserts the bound six. So let's try the same thing that we did earlier. Let's change it from ln s1 
to length of x so that should remove the checks let's see nice we get down to three but if you notice carefully we have actually added a new bounce check we have added a bounce check at line 57 so if we go to 57 we see okay so we have a new bounce check at s1 why because initially it went till less than equal to len s1 and len s1 was actually equals to the length of s1 so the compiler now it has the information that i don't need to add bounce checks for slice of x but it has lost the information that s1 also doesn't need bounce checks so since it's lost it again it adds the check for s1 so we've actually traded off three bounce checks but added a new one so what can we do we can do a dummy access here since we are seeing that in line 65 and 67 we have x len s1 and x of len s1 so if we do a dummy access of x of len s1 and change this loop back to len s1 now both of our problems will be solved so s1 will back will be back to no bounce checks and the compiler will, will see that okay this is going to len s1 and since i am already doing a dummy access of x len s1 the, i don't need to put any bounce check inside the loop and both of these will also be gone let's check that perfect so now we just have a single bounce check at line 50. now at this point we cannot do anything more because this is entirely dependent on the go compiler the compiler cannot make this connection so it has to introduce a check and we cannot do much about it so we have reduced the number of bounce checks to one now let's see how much of an improvement did we actually get so if we come to the pr here that i made and i have a couple of benchmarks in different languages and we can see that the improvement varies from 17 to 27 percent and like an average of 22 to 23 percent so yeah depending on your application this can be a decent improvement okay so let's take a look at some of the things to keep in mind while using these patterns first always focus on writing clear and correct code only optimize if you need to not all applications need to be optimized to the last millisecond there's always a cost to everything using these patterns do hurt readability so keep that in mind whenever you choose to use these tools and always always run benchmarks to actually confirm that you have made a gain there are too many times when you think that you have made an optimization but when you actually run a benchmark you see something else i know i have so it's always a good idea to confirm your improvements with a benchmark and last but not the least the compiler is being constantly improved so always check against the latest go version it might so happen that in a future go version all of the cases that i talked about earlier are being handled by the compiler itself and that's it I hope that this talk was useful and probably some of you can take some of the ideas that we talked about here and implement them in your code. But keep in mind, do not overuse them, use them judiciously and please let me know if you have any questions. That's it and enjoy GopherCon.